Thank you very much, uh, Professor Morris. You know, this night, I'm not a, a professor in the economy, <laughs> in economics, but I learned a lot. We start from the Northern Rock Bank problem, to get into the subprime mortgage people in the USA. And I think, you know, the US government to listen to you and then the three principles <laughs> and the subsequent actions and policy will present the, this one. <laughs> okay, now we have uh, some time for questions. of the current supply uh, mortgage crisis where uh, has been talked about the, ra the rating agencies play. Rating agencies like Stan and Poor, they're supposed to rate the securities correctly, but somehow the, uh, the uh, people who took out the loans uh, the, the risks uh, which are involved are not reflected in the final rating of the, the securities. Many of these securities are rated A+, plus, but in fact, uh, they're, they're not. So some people blame the rating agencies for the crisis as well. Uh, what's your view on that? <laughs> sure, you're right. Yeah, I mean that uh, they are right. Uh, the rating agencies uh, should be done a much better job. Um, I, I have uh, no knowledge of quite what they did or why. Looking back on it now, I suppose like everybody else, I can't imagine how they would have given A plus to, 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 to these, these things. It's not that uh, it was unprecedented have a lot of reform and the Savings and Loan Association problem in the state and reverberated for a year. Maybe this is in part a reflection of uh, the difficulty I was claiming that I thought people who had been trained in finance were at least good at assessing risks, who might not be good at assessing impact of contracts and incentives, the impact of contracts on risk, but that they should at least be good at measuring assessing risk. Uh, I suppose you're, you're right, but uh, the evidence in this case is that they're not. Poss possibly this has got something to do with presentation. You know that there are a lot of things bundled together in these assets. They may have been uh, if possible, they were deliberately misled. Somebody on the, the proportion in these assets, these mortgages, just as the people doing the lending were misled by many of the borrowers, you know, borrowing circumstances. Well, I, I'm sure in part it goes back to the, the lenders, the, the first level lenders. Difficulty in correctly assessing the risks that they have put down. And I, I, I could try the argument that says, well, we didn't have much of an incentive to try to assess the risks correctly. Uh, not only didn't they have an incentive to devise good contracts, they didn't even have a, a serious incentive to pay much attention to it. And I have seen that kind of thing. So, just the other day in the, in the paper, it was mentioned that a certain amount of money was available in assessing, this is the other side of the coin, uh, people who want to invest in your uh, assets. Uh, and uh, there the question is, maybe they get into money laundering. Uh, 
can we find out? Uh, a coin made by, it was one we only have a set of small amount of money given our profit margins that we could spend on trying to find out whether they are reliable lenders or not. And uh, anyway, there was an implication. We don't really have much of an incentive to find out whether the lenders or not. And, I, and that was clearly the situation we said. Okay, you seem that it's part of the problem, imperfect information. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Professor Chia? <John? laughs> you know, I wouldn't expect uh, I would see a few equations or something in presentation for a local LOA, but you know, I didn't see anything. But anyway, as long as there's a human being, okay, there always is moral hazards, right, in a way. There's human beings, moral hazards. So you have moral hazards, you have moral risk. You know, the society or the world, in a way, you know, you have a uh, risk. You know, become the world become excited or dynamic in a way. You know, other, you know, in some sense, when you can measure the risk, then the, the risk will become an asset in some sense. Is that right? So my, my question or my comment is uh, for for design of risk sharing schemes. Are we supposed to to really build in the incentive for all the parties involved to to be, you know to minimize in their parts to minimize the risk? And in the whole, you know, the total risk will be reduced or minimized, and the benefit of the parties. Are we supposed to, to build in some kind of risk share scheme or doing that? There are so many spheres where it can happen. Uh, uh, one thing I want to say is, you know, minimizing risk can be right. Uh, this is, of course, a very interesting phenomenon about the world, that uh, we have a variable of fears possibility of taking out assets, for example, that are risky, but have a much higher expected return. Uh, we, we might think of what one uh, possibility would be to, to try to outlaw all investment in risky projects. Well, we know that that, that, that terrible idea. What would the world be like if people had never invested in risky projects? Uh, we, we couldn't have got away from the Stone Age. So, uh, economic development turns on, on doing risky projects. And that's, uh, that, that's why one hesitates a little bit over the, the, the question of whether to have total guarantee of bank deposits. And certainly, I, when I'm suggesting that uh, there should be some kind of agency that constrains the kind of contracts people have, I don't want that to be in the nature of saying that we must devise contracts that give people full security. Uh, or that uh, somehow get them to behave in such a way as to minimize this. Uh, that, that wouldn't be getting you right. I find that if I could use some questions, perhaps I would love to get into the, the theory of what kinds of incentives we should provide businessmen with and what their activity is, is choosing amongst different risky projects and looking at them. And that, that's a very interesting topic. And I'm going to be talking about it on Tuesday. Uh, okay. Chinghua University. Yeah, because we listen. <laughs> but but uh, it doesn't exactly answer the question that you're raising. But at any rate, I want to emphasize no, no, that's not going to matter. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, I heard you mentioned the, the important role of the government in several places. Government as a best insurer, best uh, government agency should. Take it. Constrain the forms of contract, and the type of securities to be created, things like that. But the ability of the government, the quality of civil service, uh, civil service is a very important part, especially in a developing country. I mean, since you have been associated with Asia in general and China for several years, to how to develop the human resources or the capability of institution government, which is really part of infrastructure, to assume such important role. Do you have some comments and observations? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Oh, well, that makes a very good point. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I suppose that uh, when, when people are in favor of, of markets and independent private institutions like companies doing things and so on, and I think there are very good reasons for that. A, a major reason is the belief that people will perform better when they have incentives to perform well, and that uh, it's somehow in the nature of the public service and, and the government, the people working within it cannot have especially good incentives, at least not of a financial nature, to do the job well. Uh, and uh, I think that, that's indeed a problem. I happen to think that in insurance markets, that, uh, that, that there are many reasons why the balance, nevertheless, tips very much to saying this is something that uh, public servants should do. But there will be the disadvantage that they may not do it as well in, in the technical uh, sense or as quickly or, or that, as, as people who are doing it for profit might do. But uh, there's a trade off. Uh, if, if the people who are doing it for profit choose uh, quite the wrong form of contracts because they get commissions and, and so on, but then, uh, then it's not worth it. Uh, and that so much of the activity in the insurance area may be of a relatively technical kind where uh, you wouldn't be much influenced by it. Uh, you're also raising the question, I suspect a lot of people here might know something about this, They're just how good are civil servants at their jobs in, in Asia, for example? Uh, and uh, we, every day we read about some other uh, Chinese official who has uh, been behaving badly. Uh, and uh, that, that makes it look as though they you know, very good. Nevertheless, I, I would say that the, the general impression amongst my colleagues who've been studying the Chinese economy is that uh, Chinese officials are pretty competent uh, and have, have done a lot of things uh, pretty well. I mean, a lot of the Chinese economy is still state owned and effectively, therefore, you may say run by civil servants. So you'd have to explain how, how come it does so well as an economy if so much of it's being, being done by, um, by civil servants. Uh, of course, uh, you would expect me to say, and I do say, it, that uh, a very good idea to introduce um, satisfactory monetary incentives within the civil service. Uh, and uh, I think there is indeed scope for uh, what you might call many markets within the civil service. Whether that means that we should pay surgeons according to the, in, in health services, according to the success rate on, uh, on operations, I, I wonder. You, know, you can see the particular difficulties uh, around this. Uh, so I, I mentioned the standard uh, incentive method of sacking people when they're unlucky. I think that's the, that is indeed the standard method of, uh, of getting incentives, if not right, then better, in both in the public service, whether military or, or civil. Uh, it's quite a powerful method. Okay. Uh, here and there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, my name is Kosaka and I'm from Japan. Well, um, uh, I enjoyed listening to your lecture, especially you started your presentation from the uh, bank runs, and also uh, you ended your presentation uh, with a statement that uh, we can't avoid the next crisis. But maybe, <laughs> maybe the last one would have prevented. Well, um, uh, I would say that we have observed several uh, international financial crises since the uh, 1980s. 
the first one would be the Mexican report, 1982. And then we have some uh, well, uh, financial crisis in uh, developed, developed economies, late 1980s or around the, the first year of 1990s. And then Asian crisis 1997. And uh, we had a uh, possible international financial crisis uh, involved with the uh, IT bubbles, but uh, it didn't it didn't uh, become the major crisis. But 2007 subprime loans, and I would say that uh, this international financial crisis shows international risk management and also international financial risks are uh, evolutionary. <laughs> In the sense that uh, we are, every financial crisis has uh, the new aspect. For example, in the 1982, the Mexican crisis and some of the uh, international uh, bank loans programs, those are new, those were new because the uh, international bank loans to developing economies was new. And it was motivated by the, some of the financial liberalization policies. And then, uh, throughout 1982, uh, the financial uh, liberalization policies is a global trend. And so the banks are squeezed to compete each other. And also the securitization, well, uh, hits their, their, their bottoms, so that um, uh, they, they will rush. And uh, we have some pro property price, or asset market uh, price uh, crash to the end of 1980s. And that, those, are, that, those are common aspects in the, all through the developed economies. Uh, the hardest hit was, uh, or is, Japan. Yeah? So that um, this is uh, evolutionary. But uh, the securitization movement is kind of uh, appeared as a uh, counter bailing, no, no, counter uh, policy measures. But uh, as you well meticulously explained, securitization itself caused the problem this time. But every time, the most important player in this crisis is banks. And uh, the only difference between the, those international financial crises and the possible crisis uh, were involved with the IT bubbles is that um, in the case of IT bubbles, banks are not uh, seriously involved. And this time, uh, because of this, uh, uh, the bundled securitization risks, banks are involved. And banks play a very significant role in intermediating people's minor deposits. So I think that's the risks, risks no, no, international financial uh, risks or uh, the crisis, those are evolutionary. So we can't cope with it uh, well prepared way. So that your conclusion is very, very, very correct. And I think the, uh, you started your presentation with the bank runs. I think this is very essential part of the crisis. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good analysis. <laughs> 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 well, that's my presentation. <laughs> 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 right, well, so I think we're, we're in agreement in seeing that, that, um, that the uh, financial innovation appears to have been a, a major element uh, in a lot of these things. The, um, the e-com crisis. Well, now I wonder whether uh, to regard it as a crisis even, but that does Asset bubbles uh, are things that happen when the stock markets go high and then they go low and so on. I'm not sure that we could expect to, to change this this aspect of the world all that much. That comes back to the, to the remark before that we would want to minimize risk because uh, this would be rather unsatisfactory. Possibly stock markets do, well, I think it's well established that they have the effect of magnifying the, the, the true underlying risks. Uh, and to some extent, I suppose that, uh, that, that's true of, uh, of property markets too. Uh, 
the problem with our problem is market bubbles from, from time to time. Uh, but most of these don't seem to be a bit of a crisis for individuals, but they're not, not a, a major overall problem. Whereas sometimes we seem to get these big ones like um, banks going bankrupt. So that, that seems a, a serious problem. And I don't know very much about the, the Japanese problem, so I look forward to hearing more about that. To what extent that has happened because of uh, financial innovation. But uh, certainly things like uh, long-term capital management. Seems to be that sort of thing as uh, as a rather common field with, uh, with the present problems. Okay, remarkable similarity, but yeah, uh, evolution is always a problem. Yes. Thank you, uh, Professor Kosaka, for your comment. <laughs> but you have used up part of your lecture time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last last question. Last question. <laughs> okay. I like very much the conclusion, obviously, that <laughs> for the future innovation crisis. I think probably uh, one of the main things I learned as, as a small shareholder of Citibank, lost quite a bit. Uh, first, we do not trust the regulator. The, in the case of the United States, Federal Reserve obviously has not regulated what they call shadow banking uh, part of the system. And the, okay, the originated distribu distribution system, which is a part of the activity which is the origin laws, but not regulated, at least not properly regulated. Uh, secondly, we don't, we don't leave the CEOs, right? <laughs> Mary Lynch and the Citibank CEOs, they, they walked over with $100,000 despite the huge mistake they made, right? Certainly, as you mentioned, we don't trust the rating agencies, right? As opposed to the information about our clients, how risky they are. Obviously, your system cannot be trust, trustworthy. But lastly, we should blame ourselves as investors. When we buy this complicated product, uh, uh, from my bank for the billing, obviously, is uh, under, uh, I don't know how much it works now, the uh, big Chinese bank also bought billions of uh, this uh, highly. Uh, complicated uh, product. Obviously, many other parts of the world which has bought quite a bit. And they're not knowing what they are, right? So when things go bad, all things go bad. But the question is that, uh, I suppose, the investors, education is important, we, but how long can go, I'm not sure. They always take risks, they always make mistakes. And in case of regulators, if you look at Greenspan, if you read his book, the latest book he published, uh, uh, The Age of Turbulence. He said also it is a market, right? But I was against my generation. He told that the market should correct by itself. It's what it, the counterparty risk should, should resolve by itself rather than regulate the uh, subprime market, which as he was reminded, presumably by his colleague, when, when, this, when the subprime uh, issue first came up a few years ago. Uh, as far as the corporate governance in terms of U.S. systems, uh, I don't know how far we can go. <laughs> the model that they did take excessive risk without, without having been kind of penalized. Uh, the current agencies, uh, stand in pool, they may say mistake in Asian financial crisis. They are, they are lagging the case, but they are leading the case. They still do the same thing. So, <laughs> sure, the next person will come. <laughs> okay. The last question is that, do you believe that Federal Reserve could and could rescue the market by lowering the interest rates? You now they have done so for 75 basis points. They probably would do more. But that would result in sovereignty crisis rather than liquidity crisis. That's your, that's your forecast. <laughs> <laughs> Can we at least recover some of my share prices here, right? Oh, I, I couldn't possibly forecast. <laughs> and now, now you make me afraid that you might pay attention. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense for the interest rate to come back. Okay. So, thank you very much. Uh, good luck, we have a round table discussions already. <laughs> okay, let's uh, give Professor Murray a big hand. A big hand. Uh -huh. <laughs>